And we have an outstanding group of speakers and panelists who can do just that. Uh, they bring diverse and really deep experience and expertise to uh, what are very complex uh, subjects. So I want to thank all of them in advance for agreeing to participate, and I want to thank everyone here uh, for your interest and your support. So to start things off, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, first um, thank our conference sponsors, Gowling, WLG, the National Post, Wilmington Capital, Dundurn Press, which I understand is providing a special thank you to each of the speakers and conference chairs, and Heathbridge Capital. I'd also like to thank the uh, Albany Club for their services. I'm going to dispense with uh, the introductions, <coughs> excuse me, because you all have the detailed biographies in the uh, conference program, and I want to keep on schedule. Uh, as you can see, this really is a packed program and there's a great deal of information to cover. A few minutes are going to be set aside after each of the sessions for, for questions and comments, and at the end of the day we'll have about a half an hour uh, for more general discussion on matters that were raised during the, uh, during the main session. So now I'd like to introduce our opening keynote speaker, someone who is well known as a journalist, editor, commentator, author, think tank fellow, someone who is brimming, I would say, with interesting ideas that frequently challenge conventional thinking. And may I say that we need that in Canada. We need to challenge the settled orthodoxy, not only because it's lively and interesting, but more importantly, because it enhances the vibrancy and health of our democracy. So Diane Francis, welcome, and we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, it's going to work, right? Uh, thanks for that lovely introduction. Joe is a terrific finance minister and a very nice fellow, and he's uh, got a conflict of interest because we're friends. <laughs> anyway, thank you for calling me Brimming. That's a new one. Uh, and what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give you a keynote on these three very different topics that are in the program uh, from the journalistic 32,000-foot altitude. It's going to be broad brush to mix metaphors. It's going to be uh, my take. And I'm not an expert on any of this, but I do know a little bit about a few things and I'll give you my take on it. So hopefully it will spark some questions and some interesting debates during your panel sessions. Okay, here we go. As you can see, I have a few gigs. Okay, money laundering, cryptocurrencies, and cybersecurity issues. They're not really linked. <laughs> uh, sometimes they overlap, but uh, they're linked in this program. Uh, those are just some of the things that uh, I think are going to become more and more important and on the public mind and in policy circles. White collar crime, how do I know anything about crime? I've written 10 books in Canada, three on white collar crime. Why did I write on white collar crime? The first book was about entrepreneurs, which was about the unbelievable degree of stock market fraud and the shenanigans that were going on in Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, uh, all the stock exchanges in Canada. It was uh, the Wild West. And we didn't have securities laws in Canada until 1972. <laughs> so the baddies all came here and they did their thing. So I wrote about that very entertaining book. And they, were, uh, they populated and, and really ran the investment banking uh, world in Canada until that thing happened, BRIEX. And then BRIEX was, of course, the world's biggest gold swindle and could only have happened in a climate that Canada had created, particularly at uh, Montreal, Vancouver, and Calgary stock exchanges, where there were very few rules uh, compared to Toronto's, which were fewer rules than New York's. Um, the one in the middle, Underground Nation, I wrote about all of the uh, shocking uh, social and entitlements fraud that was pervasive in Canada. Um, and I started to get people deep throats giving me information. Uh, my favorite stories when uh, uh, Premier David Peterson hired uh, to run the Workmen's Compensation Board, which was riddled with fraudulent practices, a man who had been convicted of fraud um, before. 
guess he didn't do any due diligence on that person. But when I wrote this book in 91, uh, the uh, social, social welfare offices in Toronto, there were 50 offices and none of which were connected by computers. So all you had to do was take your, your date of birth and go and get 50 welfare checks a month from 50 different offices, none of whom communicated with each other. I mean, it was rampant. Unemployment insurance was fraud. Immigration was fraud. Um, so that book debunked a lot and exposed a lot of the, the worst practices, which eventually did get cleaned up. New revelations, old stories. These are the Paradise Papers, the Panama Papers. There's a lot of buzz in the media about the Panama Papers is a pretty clear-cut case of secret companies that were created by a law firm in Panama with the sole purpose of tax evasion, therefore also money laundering and terrorist financing. Paradise Papers is a little different. It's about our friend Bermuda, and Bermuda is known to a lot of Canadians. It's been one of the favored uh, tax and secrecy havens by Canadians, and you know some of our prime ministers are noted in here, uh, Paul Martin and... Um, Mulroney and Kretzian as having dealings there, but really they just had something that didn't seem to appear to be anything exceedingly, certainly uh, illegal. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, smoke and mirrors around the Paradise Papers. There are some people that have actually been caught. Uh, for instance, the major uh, investors in Silicon Valley out of Russia have kept their, their stuff here with this particular uh, firm, um, bank, whatever it is. So, but there's mostly a lot of smoke and mirrors. However, I'm very glad that these leaks are happening because this is what I call the new journalism. One of the problems in the world, the scourge of the world, if I might say, is money laundering, illicit capital flows for whatever reason, tax evasion, terrorist financing, money laundering. And this is impenetrable unless you have leaks, unless you have this kind of thing happening. Um, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit of that uh, in a minute. Uh, the weapons for all of these things, illicit capital flows, which are, I'll give you the scale of magnitude of the problem. It is actually ruinous to civilization, no less, in my opinion, are the secrecy and tax havens. Uh, we all know about those, but there's some new ones. Um, Canada has a long-standing anti-tax tradition, going back to the bad old days of Bay Street that I came to uh, immigrate to when I was a young teenage legal secretary. I worked at Fraser Beatty, uh, which had an office on the corner of Bay and Adelaide, and my lawyer, who I worked for, was the tax partner, and his only client was E.P. Taylor, the richest man in Canada at the time. This is in the late 60s. And all we did was create letters patents, four or five a day, to create uh, corporations that were really uh, secret. He invented the numbered company. Uh, we just crank out these corporations every day, put a nominal amount of money in with the sole purpose of avoiding, avoiding taxation because the, he would spread his, his profits and income across more small businesses and get the small business tax credit. And of course, he built Lyford Key for people like him who didn't like to pay tax. So Canada has a very big tradition of, of rich people who don't pay tax and an industry that enables it. Major secrecy haven, Vancouver, real estate. Imagine that. Look at that, look at that island. I mean, it's quite shocking. It's the third most expensive city in housing terms after Hong Kong and Sydney, which are also money laundering destinations. This has to do with the looting of China by the rich people in China who have currency restrictions of 50,000 a year to take out, but exceed those through various ways. It's not just China. Uh, this, is, this is populated by all kinds of uh, maybe unsavory characters, uh, people from all over, all over Asia, South America, and Europe who are getting their money out, and they buy a safety deposit box in the sky called a condo, and they don't have to disclose the beneficial ownership. They can buy it through proxy, so they hide it from the tax departments and the governments they've taken the money from, and it's a nice little dodge but it's populated a city like that and driven up the housing prices to alarming levels. Vancouver is the most expensive city in the Western Hemisphere. The result of that is the loss of head offices and opportunities and housing uh, prices are, are now a big social problem. Another Canadian secrecy haven, Toronto. 
Imagine that, our dear Toronto, we're so proud of our new skyline. Well, guess what? Most of it's money laundering. Most of it is Kazakhstan, Russian, Ukrainian, Chinese, all kinds of people, Korean, people who are buying condos, hiding the identity of them, and they're either, they're, they're doing it for that reason, or they're doing it also as an investment, but they're doing it beyond the long arm or the short arm of the law, law, lawful tax collectors in their own communities. Now, some of them are doing this, and it's quite sensible. If you live in a place like Kazakhstan that's run by five people, and they're all mafia, you know, you want to hide your money because they'll steal it if you don't get it out. And I understand all of that, but this is a problem for Toronto. This is a problem for Canada. And we have allowed it because we allow secrecy. We allow secrecy. We allow secret corporations, anonymous corporations, and the beneficial ownership is not searched by the law firms who set up the companies or the accounting firms. And they, they funnel the money through lawyers' trust accounts. That's what they're doing. And they're doing it in, on a very large scale. Some of these buildings, uh, I, in my neighborhood in Yorkville, there's a couple of buildings that are what I call zombie buildings. There's nobody there. They've been up for four or five years. I'm talking about 2,000 apartments where the lights are rarely on. And they were bought, I've, I've snooped around, and they were bought 40 blocks at a time, 40 apartment units sight unseen at a time. And they're flipped amongst the whoever the owners are on a regular basis, not particularly those buildings, but this has been happening. And that's a gray market that's actually should be uh, under, the, under the aegis of the Ontario Securities Commission, frankly. And I wrote about that several years ago, and Jim Flaherty, when he was finance minister, was on it, and he started to curb um, people um, increasing their mortgages, uh, foreign investors taking advantage of, of cheap uh, Canadian mortgages and so on to stop it because it's a bubble. More tower cranes right now in Toronto than any other city in the United States, and 260 more high-rise projects on the books. So this is unimpeded. And I have written about it. I've done documentaries with Global TV, with CBC. I've appeared on 60 Minutes. Nothing stops, because this is an industry. This is an industry. Unethical behavior by lawyers. FinCEN is the United Nations. A regulator that goes around and audits countries and has repeatedly, and as recently as a year ago, outed Canada's real estate and the United States, lawyers and real estate developers and realtors for using their trust funds and their marketing efforts to bring in money uh, that uh, is being laundered or uh, otherwise used. Now, the banks. FinCEN cracked down on the banks 25 years ago. The banks are very good. They do due diligence. The accounting firms as well. They really carefully look for the beneficial owner. In countries like Britain and Australia, where we have the same legal system, they are now, the lawyers have now agreed to audit and, and find out and have on hand the beneficial ownership of all the people that they open accounts for or use trust funds for or uh, set up companies and tax avoidance strategies for, and they are supposed to do that due diligence, and they have agreed to do that, and they um, have also uh, are, have agreed to be subject to spot audits by the tax department, inland revenue in Britain and, and in Australia to stop this. Um, we had a case, and this is from the Times Colonist, because there was a trial uh, in Vancouver recently of a Canadian lawyer who, had, uh, who was caught um, in the course of four months having $26 million U.S. passed through his legal trust fund, even though he did nothing legally for that client. He was a pipeline to buying real estate by persons unknown. He was disciplined by the BC Law Society and given a slap on the wrist. So they put, a, they put the blinders on Madam Justice. Socioeconomic damage to uh, enabler countries like Canada, host countries like Canada and the US to a lesser extent, although they've had so many controls over foreign money coming in for terrorist purposes, the Patriot Act and so on, uh, that they have not had the same deluge, but at the high end they have, and now they are requiring in seven cities, the US Treasury Department, to know that developers have to know and are responsible for finding out the true beneficial ownership of anybody who buys a condo. 
in Miami, in New York, in LA, in all the areas where the hot money gravitates, from Latin America as well as Europe and Asia, and Africa. So you can see these are, these are really serious problems. When we read statistics like Canada, Canadians have the highest consumer debt in the world, that's not because we spend a lot of money on cars and stuff. We have, to, we have to mortgage ourselves up so high to buy a house because we've allowed this to get out of control in our major cities that we have the highest consumer debt in the world. And that is not a good thing. This could end up being our prime, our subprime catastrophe if it, if it is continued and it, and it doesn't, isn't, isn't abated and stopped. Now we're getting into the real global story. This is a crisis. If you look at the average illicit financial flows, this is from the Global Integrity Foundation, which I, I go to, I attend their conferences. They do a very good job. They have economists that crunch these numbers. And they do it in terms of not just hot money cash flowing into secret companies, but also how people ch cheat on the trading. In other words, they over invoice, under invoice, all those money laundering techniques that are really widespread. So for instance, a um, Mexican drug dealer will be paid in, in, in very priceless cattle uh, by his Texas uh, drug uh, clients, uh, and he'll pay a penny a, a head for the cattle. That's how they, they launder it. And so this is the global crisis. China is, that's $125 billion a year coming out of that country in the form of either the over-under invoicing or over-under paying for assets. In other words, a company <clears throat> in one of these or an entity in one of these countries will pay twice as much for something and get the kickback when they arrive. Uh, and they will therefore have looted the company that they, whose, whose, uh, whose money they spent buying the assets. These are all the techniques that are used and they're well-worn and easily, easily uh, detected if people are looking. Um, Canada has a FinCEN um, monitoring service, but the report that the UN did auditing Canada said it was inadequate in as much as, and the police tell me that they're deluged with all this, hey, look at this and look at that, but they can't give any names and they can't give any addresses. I mean, come on, uh, this is crazy. And so this is the kind of thing that's happening. I've written a lot about this. If you wanna just look up the archive of my stuff on my website or just on Google, Diane Francis Money Launder in Canada, you'll see about five or six uh, articles pop up, which explain a lot of this. It, so it's quite ruinous for these countries. And it's not just organized crime. Very often that's most of it, but very often these are, these are kleptocracies. These are states run for the benefit of the few that control them, and this is what they do. This is a funny question, okay. Top source of FDI to the United States last year. Top source, British Virgin Islands. The 5,000 people in Brit that live in British Virgin Islands directly invested in the United States funds that were the highest in the world. It was almost half a trillion dollars. 5,000 people, guess what? It was through them. And it was the, they're a conduit for, for a lot of, of, of shenanigans. The looting of Africa. This is a particularly awful situation. Um, Africa's GDP grows by less in absolute dollars every year than the amount of illicit financial capital leaving that continent. It is shrinking. It is shrinking in wealth every year, year after year. And this is very well known. Um, not just corporations that go and exploit the place, but the leadership of these countries. And the weapons, as I say, are anonymous companies. I like that line, the getaway vehicle for the criminal or the corrupt. The anonymous company is the problem. And it should be stopped. There's a bunch of laws in the US. And as I say, Britain and Australia have cracked down on it. Canada doesn't even discuss this. Um, and I'll give you the reason why. And uh, they're cracking down on it. It's hard to get past because people like to hide their wealth for lots of nefarious reasons. And the principal accessory to Canada's secrecy industry. You know, we were, we were criticized as Australia and Britain and the United States were in the last audit that FinCEN and the UN did 
And so the result of that was Canada, the federal government, created legislation that would impose on the legal profession in Canada and the real estate developers the same um, requirements for due diligence and disclosure of beneficial ownership and the burden of deputizing to monitor the flows of hot money that Britain and Australia adopted. And their legal profession didn't like it. Well, here in Canada, the heart of hot money, Vancouver, the BC Law Society, took this federal legislation through the courts and won at the Supreme Court on the basis that client lawyer privilege was sacrosanct under the Constitution. And the court reluctantly gave down that decision and then said to the federal government, the Canada, who instituted the, the curbs, try it again, just change it a little bit, we'll pass it. They agreed, but they couldn't in the, in the face of the, the way the, the case was presented. So the federal government is putting together another attempt to go through the courts and finally bring um, the legal profession to heel, long overdue. This is a very salacious story about a uranium company, a Canadian owned and sold to Russians and so on. Uh, there's a lot of nonsense that's in the news about it. The Clintons, it wasn't really uh, influence peddling. But the reason I raise this is that uh, the Clinton Cash book outlines the fact that Mr. Clinton in his um, foundation, the Clinton Foundation Initiative, was forbidden from taking money from foreign governments or bad guys, known bad guys. And whatever contributions and donations were made to the Clinton Foundation, Global Initiative, had to be disclosed. The persons, the beneficial, you know, the persons. So what did he do? He started a trust fund in Toronto. And hundreds of millions of dollars have gone into that Clinton Justra trust fund in Toronto, and we don't know how many foreigners have contributed to that, and the money goes out to the New York without having to be disclosed because it came from a Canadian trust, which is secret. So we're enabling this kind of stuff. I mean, that's very scandalous in my, in my mind. Beneficial ownership and transparency, that's the solution. You have to have legislation, all levels of government and all walks of life, that beneficial ownership has to be known. You don't deal with people that are wearing masks. You do not do that, and that is how you clean up this problem. Okay, on to cybersecurity. These are all the brand names that have been hacked. Uh, I'm not an expert in this. Uh, it's very interesting, and uh, the, you'll have a panel that'll know a lot more than I do about it, um, except that you know it's the, it's the growth industry in the tech world right now. Blockchain is an anti-hacking tool in actual fact, blockchain is the underlying architecture of Bitcoin and Ether and the other cryptocurrencies. I'm not convinced that it is unhackable, but I'm also convinced that it is a more transparent way. It is a ledger where everybody on a transaction in real time goes on that ledger and, and that's validation and it's transparent. So to the extent that that rolls out that way, and this again is going to require governance and policy, um, it's, it looks to me promising. And people are looking at it not for cryptocurrencies. That's, another, that's just a use case. Cryptocurrency and blockchain are not synonymous. Cryptocurrencies are a use case for the Bitcoin architecture. The Bitcoin architecture is going to be used by a number of countries for real estate title purposes, who really owns something, so it can't, can't be stolen by some mafia guy or whatever uh, at a later date. Uh, and so that kind of thing, I think, is very, could be very helpful. So I'm just trying to tell you that don't get confused, because it is confusing. It's very, and it gets commingled in the press, and it gets commingled in our minds. So that's what it is. And those are the benefits. But that doesn't mean the cryptocurrencies that are created on top of a blockchain architecture are bulletproof. And we know that they aren't yet. And then there's another problem. If you have an anonymous currency with a bit chain underneath it, but the anonymous currency can travel anywhere it wants, 
That obviously is a money launderer's dream and a terrorist financing dream and a tax evader's dream. So those things have to be looked at very carefully. Uh, Dubai will be uh, launching a currency, its currency, in a Bitcoin form. So we'll see how that rolls out. This was a huge scandal. So while the cryptocurrency can be unhackable, it's still, there still has to be a bank or a repository, unless you're spending it as fast as you come, to it, come into it. And so this was set up called Monk Gox. And look what happened. It was an intermediary where you could buy and sell Bitcoins. And if you hadn't bought or sold them yet, you could store them there. And it was completely heisted. It was uh, the whole thing. $400 million went missing, still missing. Was it the people that ran Mt. Gox, or was it hackable? And again, Mt. Gox is a new bank for cryptocurrencies, and I would advise everybody to avoid those. I think it's very dangerous. If you're earning Bitcoin or getting Bitcoin, spend it right away is my advice. ICOs, this is another phrase you're going to hear. This is the flavor of the month. These are crypto coins. And there's tons of companies, tech companies, starting up. This is a fraudster's dream. I mean, the, guy, the guys I wrote about back in the 80s in on Bay Street just love this. They just love this. So you create an ICO, an initial coin offering. This is like selling equity. This is penny stock. This is moose pasture time. You just start an ICO. Nobody has to approve it. Now, fortunately, the SEC has looked at it and ruled that it's a security and therefore subjected to laws and regulations i.e., an American citizen is not allowed to own an ICO, not allowed to own or sell one, till they figure out how to make it so that it's not just fraud on steroids. So I really think ICOs and cryptocurrencies need regulation, and uh, you've got to be very careful because it is new stuff, and uh, that's a BREEX uh, stock certificate. So uh, th there's not much difference between the two. It's just different, different labels. And uh, no time for questions. I'm out of time. So enjoy your day. Your panels sound terrific. You're going to get it drilled down much more deeply than I can do. Thank you.